health is wealth. And so we're glad we have some great panelists with us here today. And so just want to make sure we draw your attention to our uh, housekeeping rules for the day. Let me pull those up for you. Sorry, just a second here. There we go. So this webinar is being recorded and will be shared via email with all of our registrants. So if you're experiencing connectivity and audio issues, you'll be able to listen to the web webinar through its entirety and um, through the online recording. So we'll make sure we get that link out to you as quickly as possible. Now, all, mute, all participants are muted and please use the chat box to engage during uh, the webinar. Select all panelists and attendees option if you'd like your chat to be public. So I'm really, really pleased um, to have with us today an esteemed set of speakers. Our, our moderator today is Dr. Takesha Davis, CEO of New Orleans East Hospital. Dr. Jennifer Avegno, Director of the New Orleans Health Department. Jan Moeller, Director of the Louisiana Budget Project. Mr. Michael Hecht, President and CEO, CEO of GNO Inc. And Terry Sterling, who's co-chair of the Res Resilient Louisiana uh, coalition, sorry, um, it's a tongue twister. And so um, before I introduce our, our moderator, I um, just want you to know that the Louisiana Leaders webinar series has been designed to you know, highlight big issues facing our communities and then bring leaders together to have thought-provoking thought discussions about the work that's being done to address these issues throughout our region. And today we're going to focus on health inequities and the direct effect they have on a person's economic or financial health. And so our panelists today are gonna to be instrumental in that conversation, so we're glad to have them with us. And so uh, now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to turn, uh, turn the Zoom over, if you will, to uh, Dr. Takesha Davis. Um, Dr. Davis serves as CEO of New Orleans East Hospital. And in her spare time, she's uh, uh, on the board at United West Southeast Louisiana. And she serves as the secretary of our executive committee. So she's an officer of the United Way um, Corporation. So um, just a little bit about her. Um, she spent the last 10 years prior to coming to New Orleans East Hospital at the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals. And as a New Orleans native, um, who's earned her doctorate degree in medicine from Johns Hopkins University of Medicine and her master's in public health from Harvard University and has extensive experience in clinical care, community engagement, and healthcare systems management. So I don't know, we're glad to have her on the United West Southeast Louisiana Board of Trustees and on our executive committee, but we're so happy she's with us today to moderate this panel. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Takesha Davis to moderate today. Thanks, Dr. Right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you to the United Way uh, of Southeast Louisiana for really hosting uh, an important conversation during this time. Uh, and welcome to all of our esteemed panelists. I'm really excited uh, to hear from you on this topic. Uh, as we all uh, have continued to live through uh, an unprecedented pandemic, we've seen vividly the impact of disparities in health play out um, through COVID-19 and how that impacts on our most vulnerable members of our community, uh, our essential workers, uh, those who have underlying health conditions, uh, have also been disproportionately impacted um, negatively uh, by this pandemic uh, economically. And so to talk about your health as well today is timely. Uh, and so we'll jump right in uh, and wanna make sure as we uh, start with our questions that for all of you who are participating with us today uh, that we wanna hear from you as well and that you put your questions into the chat uh, so that we can also um, have our panelists to answer them. Uh, but let's start um, with uh, you, Dr. Avegno. Uh, as the City of New Orleans Health Director, uh, we've seen you leading us uh, through this pandemic with our public health guidelines. Uh, and uh, this has not been the start of this journey for you in focusing on health disparities. Uh, tell us what your health is wealth means to you. 
Well, thanks, Dr. Davis, and I'm really excited to be here with you and with our other partners. Um, you know, and, and certainly, you know, as as well as everyone it, on this um, panel, this is a, a team effort. <laughs> Currently, what we're facing now with COVID, but really the work that we've begun before this. And, you know, I'm excited to ha talk about this today uh, because this is a continuation of something that the health department started uh, pre-COVID with our community health assessment. So every five years or so, it's the charge of the local health department to do a comprehensive analysis of the state of health in our community. Um, and, you know, in New Orleans, a lot of times that's a, that's a very painful um, sort of reckoning. And so it was a almost two year process to really dive deep. And what we what we saw was not a surprise, but what it highlighted for us is the need to, to take it to a wide audience. So as health professionals, whether it's public health or clinical care, um, we're pretty well versed by now um, in disparities that plague the city and our country. We, um, we understand the importance of, of what medical professionals call the social determinants of health. The fact that anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of your medical outcomes have nothing to do with your anatomy or your physiology or what you inherited from your mama. It is social and emotional, behavioral, environmental factors that shape whether you're going to live to 65 or you're going to live to 85. Um, and so when we talk about what can we do to change the health of an individual or a community, um, very little of it really has to do with, well, are you taking the right hypertension medication? Um, it is investing in programs and policies and initiatives that not only pr produce a return for health, but economic prosperity. And when you really, really look at it, the healthiest communities are the most prosperous communities and vice versa. And so we really wanted to, first of all, shine a pretty harsh light on the inequities, uh, both health and social and economic, that exist in New Orleans, and then make the case that the biggest bang for our buck, the biggest return on investment is going to be if we as health professionals start speaking the same language as our business colleagues, uh, because the same outcomes benefit us both. Absolutely. And uh, use the word investment. Right, um, and so I'll take it the next step in saying that investment has to be intentional uh, in communities that um, house um, our vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable residents. And I know Mr. Moeller, you all with the Louisiana Budget Project um, have been monitoring and reporting uh, on our state government's investment uh, in spending that affects our low and moderate income families. What do those investments uh, look like at present uh, and where is there opportunity uh, for us to really impact um, the wealth uh, of our most vulnerable? Well, thank you, first of all, to the United Way for, for hosting this panel. Um, you know, when we, uh, you know, nobody can know when they're going to experience a, a, fine, a, a health emergency. None of us know when we're going to get seriously ill. Um, that can happen to anybody. But we do have a choice about the economic supports that we give to people and, and, and probably the most and the safety net that we build around people in cases of this. Uh, and probably the most important thing that has happened in Louisiana in the last um, probably a generation is the expansion of Medicaid uh, to low income adults, low and moderate income, mostly working age adults uh, in Louisiana, which has really been a game changer. I mean, there is a more than a half a million people are covered by Medicaid coverage today who didn't have that coverage on June 30th of 2016. Um, now there was a, a landmark study that was done uh, some years ago, it was called the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. And what, uh, what they did in Oregon uh, a few years ago, uh, more than a decade ago, was they, they expanded Medicaid to an adult population, but they did it by lottery. Um, so there was a control group who didn't get Medicaid coverage, and there was a group that did get Medicaid coverage. And so they were able to really determine what happens to somebody when they get, uh, when they get Medicaid coverage, uh, what happens to somebody. And, and there were really some, some things in that experiment that you didn't, 
you know, that, that, that those of us who, who on, on the progressive side didn't foresee, for example, it didn't re reduce the utilization of emergency rooms as much as maybe people thought. But one thing it did for sure was it virtually eliminated catastrophic medical expenses. So if you're a low income person um, who, who uh, didn't have Medicaid before, getting sick also meant being financially ruined. You didn't have a lot to begin with. And now you had a pile of me medical bills that left you really insolvent in so many ways. With Medicaid, again, people are still getting sick, but now not only do they have a means uh, to access healthcare that wasn't there before, but they can also be assured that they're, they're not going to be financially ruined as a result. And that's something people in most countries have taken for granted for a long time, but we have kind of built this safety net around people. The market is responding by uh, building a lot of new clinics in neighborhoods and, and areas that, that were underserved previously. We've seen a really big movement in the health insurance marketplace, but we're not where we need to be. We still are the only country, uh, 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 developed country in the world that doesn't have paid family leave. So we still have a lot of policies that we could pass at the state and frankly, federal level that gives people the assurance that if they get sick when that then when that medical emergency happens that there's going to be a safety net it doesn't mean losing your job and that you don't have to ch choose between staying home to care for a sick relative and losing your job so so uh we've taken some really important steps forward in this uh state in recent years that we shouldn't overlook but there's a lot more to do yeah, absolutely and that uh paid family leave um, was brought more to the forefront um, during COVID and, and continues to be uh, a challenge as we recommend that those who are uh, potentially in contact uh, with someone with COVID-19 self-quarantines. That means not go to work. Um, and many of our essential workers uh, don't have the ability, right, to have paid family leave. Um, Dr. Vegno, I know that you all uh, have done some work here um, with um, private employers uh, and are looking to lead here. Um, what should we be looking towards on the federal um, stage uh, to improve the ability for our most essential workers, and at least we're using that term now, to have the ability to have paid family leave? Right. I think COVID um, and the provisions under the CARES Act have shined a welcome light on, um, on the necessity of sick leave. But certainly, even after COVID goes away, uh, this is a critical tool in keeping individuals healthy and businesses running. Um, you know, there was initial provisions and protections for those who uh, needed to isolate or quarantine to have that sort of temporary paid sick leave. That's something that should that should continue. And I know that uh, Senator Cassidy actually has a bill that's sort of uh, in limbo at the moment, um, but that would actually provide direct support for those affected by the pandemic who needed to continue to isolate and quarantine. That's a huge step in the right direction, but it can't just be a one-time thing if we're gonna see the benefits. Over 30 states have some kind of paid sick leave protection for businesses of varying sizes in the US. Louisiana, unfortunately, is not one of them. And although in this last interrupted session, um, there was at least one, if not two bills to this effect, they really didn't go very far. But I think, you know, the, this false dichotomy between, well, if it supports health, it's gotta cost a lot of money, you know, I, I think there's a real opportunity to dispel that narrative. When when you look at sick leave policies, um, a broad study of, of taking an analysis of the effect of these policies show that they say have huge potential to save emergency department costs, unnecessary visits, unnecessary hospitalizations, and businesses save money as well because they don't have uh, as much absenteeism. People don't, um, you know, not show up or they don't show up and sick and give it to someone else who then can't, can't do their work. So I think if um, businesses and the business community really dug just a little deeper into the return on investment of something like paid sick leave, it's quite cost neutral. And again, the benefits are to your business productivity and to um, the health of our individuals in our healthcare system. Absolutely. 
and that's a great uh, segue to some of the work uh, that I know uh, Ms. Sterling is helping to lead uh, for our state uh, as co-chair of the Resilient Louisiana Commission. Um, but through your over 20 plus years of experience uh, in leading a large uh, academic uh, healthcare entity here, um, we know you've had the opportunity to see the importance uh, of looking at how do we curtail healthcare costs um, while continuing to improve the health and well being of our communities. Um, how are you and the Louisiana, Resilient Louisiana Commission, looking at ways? Uh, for our, our economic and business sector to partner with health uh, as uh, we start uh, to reopen uh, and reimagine the way to provide um, more healthy opportunities to our community members. Thank you, Dr. Davis, and uh, thank you for that question. Um, one of the first steps after we address some of the immediate recommendations around safe employer guidelines, safe employee guidelines, and those pieces, we worked with our task forces and we um, brought in the conversation of equity from the beginning. And um, you know, this the city and the state has um, worked with PolicyLink and uh, you know, Dr. Robert Blackwell in the past. And she did a presentation in, with the commission. And one of the things she shared that we brought forward was equity being the new growth model. And that when, you know, Dr. Vegna mentions that many of the things that we are asking for, when you actually look at the return on investment, it actually grows the economy, it improves um, businesses. And so we brought forth what we thought was a wider lens of equity as the growth model that really was going to promote resilience. And it really centered around four key things. The first was making the people of Louisiana our priority. When we looked at how many people who had been adversely affected, we looked at you know, the racial disparities in those pieces is to say, how do we move to the top of the good list and the bottom of the bad list when we live in an ad, you know, converse situation today? So what it will it take for each one of our business sectors to really put people first in our priority? Secondly, we ask them to be honest and to think about the racial and ethnic discrimination and disparities and to really think about those not only broadly as it related to health, but to really think about it in your own sector. What does that look like? Uh, thirdly, with Louisiana being a very rural state and having, you know, kind of core urban centers, small pockets, we wanted to kind of really dispel this idea that there's a difference between urban and rural poverty and really to think about the extreme effects of poverty and how we think about poverty as a state. And if we get away from it in these pockets and think about how do we move everyone forward? Uh, you know, we talked about, it was, you know, reference from Dr. Vengo, you know, when today your zip code determines your health outcomes more than anything, that you can take a one mile drive and your life expectancy change. And so we wanna really think about opportunities to address urban and rural policy and that where there are commonalities that we can bring um, our urban legislators and our rural legislators and our urban and rural leaders together to say let's not make this a rural and urban issue let's make it an issue about people um, and poverty and then last we talked about pathways for opportunities um, there are no social programs that ultimately create great prosperity it's through job seeking and career enhancement and small business and entrepreneurship. And so those were really the four pillars that we ask our task forces to use and use it as a lens to think about a more resilient and a better Louisiana. Those are great pillars. Uh, and when we take those pillars, right, and try to move them to action, uh, we need great partners. Um, Michael Heck, uh, as president and CEO of Greater New Orleans, Inc., you all are charged uh, in Southeast Louisiana as our economic development agency of how do we move our business sector, right, to action around those pillars. Talk to us about the pathways for opportunities, particularly for our most vulnerable members of our population and creating that equity um, that GNO, Inc. is working on. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davis. And I think this probably goes back to how we modified our mission statement now about a year and a half ago 
to make it to create a thriving economy and an excellent quality of life for everyone. And the for everyone we put in there intentionally because we thought that it had both a moral and a material basis. Uh, it's the right thing to do. But also, if you want an economy that's going to be firing on all cylinders, then everybody has to be participating and reaching their fullest potential across race, across gender, across every type of way that you would, uh, you would think about people. So that's kind of the framework that we, um, that we, that we try to approach. Um, the, you know, the idea of, of health equals wealth is actually a literal one. Um, if you, you know, look at the data, um, individuals that experience chronic disease have on average 18% lower income than those that are healthier. And wealth is just income over time discounted back um, by inflation. So there's actually a literal relationship um, between uh, health and wealth. Um, and so if you want to have an economy that is um, you know, operating at its fullest potential, you have to ensure that all of your citizens um, are healthy. And then, of course, it does go back to the corporate level as well. If you want a company that's operating, you have to ensure that everybody is is healthy. So I think that a lot of the way that we have to frame this for companies is what I think Dr. Avegno and others were getting at is talking about the, um, the overlap or the consistency between money and morality. When those two things come together, we're able to make great things happen. Um, you know, some examples of that include uh, our work on criminal justice, uh, our work on coastal restoration. Uh, I think beyond the current stuff we've been doing on early childhood, is all because the business community looked at this and said, well, look, this is the right thing to do and it's got a positive ROI. So I think we just have to continue to frame this um, in the right way for, for business. And let me just add that the way that we think about prosperity for all and including everybody in the economy uh, as a way of generating wealth, which is going to lead to better health outcomes is by trying to ensure that we look for a diversity of jobs and then ensure there's the awareness and access to and training for these jobs, all individuals. Um, we, we focus a lot in Louisiana and New Orleans on our affordability crisis uh, in every area, not just healthcare, but also housing or insurance. Uh, if you actually look at the data, um, our affordability overall is just about at the national average. Um, our challenge is that individuals lack wealth um, our average income is about $12,000 below the national average. And so a lot of our focus is on the wealth side of the, of the equation, because if we get that up, then individuals will have access um, to what they need, even as we work on the affordability issues. So as we look at the disparity uh, that we all are aware of um, with uh, members of our community, particularly um, culture bearers uh, come to mind, uh, and that even uh, where we see uh, an average household income in the greater New Orleans area, uh, around $36,000 a year for our culture bearers, um, it's closer to around 20,000. We've also seen the disparate impact um, of health disparities and health outcomes on them. Um, Dr. Vegno, um, when we think about the great resource uh, that those culture bearers are uh, to our economy, uh, overall, um, how do we tell the story of the importance of investing uh, in their health so that they can get to sustainable wealth uh, in tackling this inequity? Well, they are our wealth, right? Um, you know, without the the work and the talent and the drive and the dogged commitment of our culture bearers, we would not be New Orleans and we would not be the prospering in the things that we are prospering. And, I, you know, I would say we do have a vibrant cultural and hospitality scene, and certainly that's been a strong suit. Um, but, you know, having strong uh, protections for all of our workers, regardless of their gig, right, and many of them are gig workers, and thus left out of traditional programs, you know, um, that's what it takes to build a strong infrastructure for a community that can be accessible and open to everyone. So, you know, as, as one of the other panelists mentioned, um, Medicaid expansion was and is a game changer. And we're not gonna know the effects of that 
for a few years now. But that did allow our, many of our cultural workers who do not have traditional insurance through their many, many gigs um, to finally secure access to primary care, to specialty care, to preventive medicine, mammograms, colonoscopies. So I firmly believe that that action is going to save the lives of an awful lot of our really important citizens. Again, we need to do more. You know, going back to sick leave, one of the things that the, the, the CARES Act did was to help provide some sort of protections for our gig workers. In New Orleans, um, and I know Michael Hecht can probably tell me the percentage of this, but there is a huge percentage of our workers that qualifies that, who again, they've got transient protections now. There's really no reason, either from the health or the economic side, not to find a way to make them permanent. Um, you know, coming up with supportable living wages you know, why don't we pay our trumpet players like we pay lawyers, right? Um, one, one could argue that the, the product is, is maybe sweeter. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, all of the things that create the, the floor, a high floor for an entire community, the communities that are thriving are the ones that don't let folks fall through that floor. And particularly in New Orleans, when those folks are the ones that make us special and different from every other city, you know, we, we have to provide them with some basic protections. And those protections, as you said, um, are uh, essential, right, for those essential workers. Um, and we think about what else um, do we need to do if we're truly going to focus on underlying social determinants of health uh, across not just uh, our physical um, health that we typically talk about, but all of the other uh, challenges that we see in the compound disadvantage that leads to those um, discrepancies in life expectancy based on zip code uh, around affordable housing, as you guys have mentioned, the living wage, uh, and having um, quality education. Uh, Ms. Sterling, talk to us about um, what do healthcare providers, health systems, insurance providers, what should we be doing to really tackle the social determinants of health? Often um, we are faced with just focusing um, downstream uh, on taking care of sick people, but if we really want to move uh, to building an equitable culture of wellness, uh, what should we be focusing on? You know, I think we have to start with a broader view of health. You know, we celebrate when we build a building and a building is really just a place. And I think, you know, we have to be strategic about what's going on in the building. What services are offered in the building? When we build a new clinic in an underserved neighborhood, and our healthcare provider isn't engaged in the quality of the school, whether there is banking that's available, whether there is affordable housing, we really have to bring all of the sectors together to say, if we just, you know, rather than sprinkle a little bit across it, you know, I like to say it's like spreading peanut butter and you spread them red, everybody gets a little bit versus really taking to say, let's begin to build pods and then put everything that you need around that pod that drives into the social determinants of health. And then to make certain that you can then bring that entire community up. You know, one of the things when we talked about banking and, you know, Louisiana and New Orleans, you know, I had not seen the red line map of New Orleans from historical banking discrimination until um, the Federal Reserve brought it to one of our meetings. And the longstanding impact of that um, in, in housing and communities just continues to linger and are key drivers to some of these social determinants of health. And so it's not until we really take that entire approach to say, how do we go into an area? You know, there's outcomes and Alden McDonald who's worked in banking and housing for a long talked about the difference between if you take a neighborhood and move it from 40% home ownership to 60% home ownership. The difference in the economic viability, having a food, a grocery store that then can sustain itself and provide fruits and vegetables and those things. And so there's the piece in America that's about individual wealth 
is exclusive to community wealth. And I think we have to think about that differently to say it's a both and. And to think about if we're gonna invest in a community and we're gonna invest in an area and we're gonna bring these pieces and, and you know, Michael talked about many of the pieces, but let's fill out the entire social determinant scope and say, we're gonna address this community. You know, a child who experiences trauma and the work on ACEs and the impact of children, that child is gonna be that six out of 10 African-American child who doesn't graduate from high school, who then is gonna fall into poverty and there's a, a cycle there. So to me, it's, it's a global piece about how we make choices and that these decisions won't be made on their own and they won't fall to us in happenstance. It's really about a deliberate approach to how we now thread the needle on the systemic approach. And I really liked the kind of, the theme of this conversation about health and wealth because it really brings it together to say, your address should be a proxy for opportunity, not a proxy for the shortening your life. And we really have to think about how we take addresses and neighborhoods and transform them systematically. And there are many models. The Democracy Collaborative is a healthcare oriented group. And they really focus on how you partner, you know, not only how health systems build clinics, but what do they do with their large philanthropic donations? What do they do with their large investment portfolios? What do they do with their purchasing power? And so there's a lot that can be done. Many health systems are now into housing um, and doing housing development. And so uh, to me, it's a community approach, it's a global approach, but it's a both and between individual wealth and community wealth and really changing how we measure community wealth. It's important, um, and I like that you uh, use the example about the banking disparities. Right, because again, to um, refocus um, our um, viewers uh, and listeners today on the fact that, that where we are uh, with the disparities uh, in both health and wealth uh, are not because of defective character traits of residents or poor decision making, right? These have been long standing systemic policy and practices that have led to these inequities, which means that we have to be as intentional in the systemic way that we tackle them. So Mr. Muller, as we talked about uh, what opportunities we have here in the state of Louisiana, uh, we have now coming upon us a, a transition uh, at the federal level. Um, what are opportunities there for policy changes uh, that couldn't help uh, in tackling some of these inequities that we see around uh, health outcomes? Uh, and really long-standing uh, wealth inequities? Well, uh, and this really needs to happen before January 20th, is uh, Congress needs to pass a new stimulus bill. Um, if we have learned anything from this pandemic, uh, it's that, that the economy is not going to recover and, and resume its growth pattern until the pandemic is under control and people feel safe enough to travel, to socialize, to congregate uh, uh, in places. Um, so, so until you get the pandemic under control, the economy is gonna be held back, particularly the service economy that drives so much of New Orleans. And until the pandemic is under control, the federal government has a very vital role to play in making sure uh, people and families can sustain this period. We all hope that the vaccines are successful and that they're distributed and that there might be an endpoint to this sometime in 2021. We don't know that for sure, but until that endpoint comes and people come back to New Orleans for vacations and, and conventions and so on, the federal government has to step in to help. The hope was that they were gonna do this back in July and early August when all of, most of the CARES Act stimulus uh, started to expire. But Congress, of course, deadlocked. Um, Congress is still deadlocked. Um, every day there's, you know, five more stories about what's going on. So uh, hopefully they'll do it during this lame duck period. If not, it needs to be the absolute first thing on President Biden's plate is to pass a comprehensive stimulus package 
that keeps families whole and gets them some economic relief until the end of the pandemic. It shouldn't be an arbitrary date in the future. It should be the federal government is going to provide a safety net, whether that's direct checks to families or, or expansions of, of existing tax credit. I would prefer that it's targeted to families that need it the most mm -hmm. so that it's not necessarily sending my family uh, $1,200 when both my wife and I are employed and we are able to, to make it through this, but to target it to, to the workers who really need it, uh, and particularly the gig workers in New Orleans. So I think that is the main thing. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, and I, I'm not saying this to be political, but there were threats to the Affordable Care Act and there are still threats because the Supreme Court heard a, an argument on, on a, a, a challenge to that law. And so hopefully, I think uh, if, if the Supreme Court rules, as I think many people expect, then we know that the Affordable Care Act is safe, that Medicaid expansion will be preserved. And then uh, Congress can get about um, you know, the business of trying to build on the Affordable Care Act, build on the successes we've had in, in making uh, coverage available to more people. The fact is Medicaid expansion has been a game changer for people who make less than 138% of the federal poverty line. But there are a lot of people who are just above that line who are still struggling to get by, who are buying insurance through the exchanges. That can be very difficult. It can be very expensive. It's not a perfect system. And, and a lot of people who, aren't, who don't consider themselves middle class and certainly aren't wealthy still have an enormous amount of, of problems affording basic health care in this country. And that's a problem that Congress needs to work on. Uh, not only does America have a health system that, that leaves you know, tens of millions of our fellow citizens uncovered without any kind of safety net, but it's also the most expensive health care system anywhere in the world. We spend more uh, money as a percentage, as a share of our economy than anybody else in the world by far so there needs to be a, a conversation about how do you expand coverage, but also how do you get the cost under control so that healthcare doesn't swallow up all of government, which it will do if it goes unchecked. So, so uh, I think both conversations are very important. I hope that once we get the stimulus uh, deal taken care of, that that's a conversation that can happen uh, over the next four years. That's yes, all. That, that's I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Michael, as we uh, think about, you know, healthcare can be bankrupting, right, to uh, someone who has an unexpected uh, health challenge, um, but providing health coverage um, and um, covering essential workers and employees is a, a real challenge uh, for a lot of our businesses as well. Uh, as we think about uh, our um, reimagining uh, as we reopen uh, post-COVID uh, and the challenges that our business sector has faced, uh, what are some of the, the things that you all are doing to help them to do that uh, in an equitable way and hopefully lead to investment and reinvestment uh, and more of our communities that need their help? Yeah, so I think, the, I mean, the, a few points here. The first is that there is a, a moral and practical question about whether businesses are the best place and the right place to provide health care coverage. Um, so my wife is, is Danish. And so I've spent a lot of time in Denmark and studied it and concluded that there's very little you can compare between the two places. It's a country of 5 million people with seven last names, kind of like Louisiana, um, except totally different. Um, but what's interesting is that, so Denmark always wins the award for the happiest country on earth, right? But if you spent a lot of time in Denmark, like I have, it's actually not a particularly like crazy happy place. It's actually very Lutheran, right? <laughs> What it is, in fact, is not the happiest place on earth, but it's the least miserable place on earth. And that's a very important distinction. And the reason is that although it actually is quite a capitalist economy in a lot of ways with some great companies like Maersk and Novo Nordisk, right? There's a safety net, including universal health care, which means that nobody is ever at fundamental fear for their life if they have a health event, physical or mental. And I would argue that one of the reasons why it is such a successful economy, and it does actually have the money to reinvest in universal health care, is because that health care exists in the first place. It's a, it's a positive um, cycle that exists. And so um, I just think it's interesting to kind of think about 
what creates an economy where people can not be living in fear of, of what happens next and how that produces positive um, outcomes. Um, in terms of what we're doing here um, at, at GNO Inc., there are a number of policies that we are um, supporting at the state level. Paid family leave, again, is, 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 is a huge issue. Uh, we've talked about that and, and COVID has highlighted the need for that. Um, COVID has also highlighted uh, how telemedicine is going to be an increasing part of our future. And so that brings to bear the issue of the digital divide. Um, in order to have telemedicine, uh, in order to diagnose and treat disease, people have to have proper internet access. And so uh, we think that the digital divide actually is a health issue uh, as well. I'm um, at the federal level, they're kind of a different cascading or ordered levels. The first issue, of course, is going to be just uh, getting the vaccine out um, as quickly as possible. Um, Gina Wink doesn't have a, a, a policy role in that per se, but like I, for example, am enrolling in the vaccine trials just to kind of model for people that everybody has something that they can be doing um, for this. Uh, then talking to folks in the Biden administration, clearly um, his priority is going to be protecting Obamacare and expanding access. And, uh, Gina Wink wants to support that. And then on the other side of the fence, I think we have to applaud, and we've mentioned it, a lot of the work that uh, Dr. Cassidy has been doing um, as a senator. He has work on uh, paid family leave. Uh, he has work on drug price transparency, and he has also legislation on, um, on uh, eliminating surprise, surprise billing at hospitals, all of which are very real issues, and all of which get at the fundamental issue about healthcare in this country is that we have to move a system away from being based on paying for treatment to one that incentivizes health. And that is kind of a life work body of work because all of the structures and systems are kind of aligned to the former and not the latter. And so, um, you know, if, if I could do my life over again and started this 50 years ago, maybe I would take that up because it truly is a life body uh, of, of, of work. It is, and, and um, while challenging, right, to move our systems uh, from focusing on um, sick care, right, to a focus uh, on well care uh, and really incentivizing health, um, we have to think about the people uh, who not just from the system standpoint from health, but are faced with this compound disadvantage, right, that we deal with disproportionately living in poverty, um, that they don't have a safe, in affordable housing, they don't have access uh, to quality education, live in communities um, that have more blight uh, and violence uh, in them than we would like. Um, one of our um, viewers uh, asked a question, outside of passing a stimulus package, right, that we know is necessary and needed, um, but it's episodic. How do we really start to look at peeling back the onion of this compound disadvantage with strategies that we can employ locally uh, in the state of Louisiana. Uh, so I, I'll open that up uh, to, to each of you uh, and start with uh, Dr. Vegno, but uh, looking for, you know, how do we create some action now to start to tackle these social determinants? It, it can really seem daunting. Um, you know, it, it, it can make you want to sort of throw your hands up. But I think the first thing is to to reach the community um, and just make folks aware of what is already out there. Again, going back to Medicaid expansion, we have been able to cut our uninsured, uninsured rates in half. But there are still folks that I, as an emergency physician who works part-time in the ER, it astounds me how many folks don't know that they can have access to Medicaid and what that means. And that means they can get a colonoscopy and a mammogram and a primary care doctor and start to talk about prevention, right? It's not all of the preventative things. I can't fix their streets. I can't, you know, make it so that their commute to work is less than an hour on public transportation. But I think there's a lot of resources that we have in the city that um, we're just not, as a healthcare provider, I'm not doing a good job or maybe I'm not the right person to sell that message. We have to do a better job of working with those who, who can reach hard to reach individuals. And I think that that's true on the health side, it's also true on the workforce development side. Um, 
And Dr. Davis, you know, your institution is very invested in not only taking care of your, your body, but making sure you have uh, training and opportunities for the community that you serve. And I think there's a lot of folks that just don't know about the what exists. And the, the more that folks take advantage of what we have, it's a lot easier to go and sell to expand a program or to bring more resources. Yeah, that workforce development um, portion uh, is important. And as you think about um, that initial question, Ms. Sterling, how do we go upstream in providing uh, opportunities um, to uh, our children uh, around STEM, making sure they're aware uh, of opportunities to be able to build wealth uh, and thus for improving their access to optimal health? Um, you know, Michael Heck made reference to it, and it was the one topic that regardless when we put the Resilient Louisiana Commission, the digital divide is a game changer. And it, it's banking, it's education, it's really, you know, healthcare in those pieces. And, you know, we talk about beyond the stimulus package, what needs to happen at the national level, we really need national digital standards. You know, when we have connected with other states who've had commissions that, that you know impacted their resilience and their return from COVID. The digital divide was on everyone's list. But what we don't need are 50 sets of digital standards that then you don't, if you have a healthcare platform here, it doesn't work there. If you have an education platform here, it doesn't work there. And so really a focus on digital standards, digital divide, going the final mile when we talk about getting to rural versus urban we've got to get you know that is a huge rural issue in louisiana and so i think that the digital divide as it relates to educating our children um, is important the other piece though i think is for our children and for everyone when we talk about a sick care system and transitioning to a well care system we have to stop reimbursing based on sick care right when we have many of these little small demonstration projects where a tenth or one percent or two percent of a hospital's reimbursement with one of the big payers um, gets put at risk that's not enough to change behavior the other component is in both our health systems and our payers who then represent if we think about how much money the state is pushing now through the carriers through Medicaid, we don't have any transparency of outcomes. We don't get outcomes by gender. We don't get them by ethnicity. We don't get them by zip codes to be able to hold them accountable to say, we're giving you X number of millions of dollars of health for our kids and for our families. We want to understand, are you moving the dot? And how do we put more money at risk that you actually, we're going to pay you. There's no, there's no other system that you get paid and produce outcomes the way that we produce the outcomes today in our healthcare system. And, you know, I understand, you know, that it, it takes a lot to really change that. But I think we have to begin to look at the model differently. And that if we're going to go from sick care to well care, that we have to do it differently. And then lastly, to speak specifically more about our children. You know, I was, you know, fascinated by the fact that Mexico decided to put education on television during the pandemic. They got through all of these other barriers of how to educate children and just said they were gonna program education. And I think it's about thinking about it differently. And I think when we think holistically again about, I'm not thinking about my segment or you know my particular child, but I'm thinking about how do I make every child educated? We all remember Sesame Street and Schoolhouse Rocks and how kids learn certain things. But we didn't take that next step. And, and I just think it's really changing how we think about educating our kids and educating them in a way that is transformative. And ultimately, I believe that both the internet and other progressive mechanisms are going to help us really kind of turn healthcare and education on its ears because I think so much, if we can get the digital divide addressed, can be delivered into a home or into a school or into a setting that can transform the educational life of a child. How do we get those systems, right, to stop working in their silos? Um, 
you know, we all have spoken about the need, right, for uh, our educational system and our healthcare system, businesses, banking, uh, to, to work together. Uh, are there ways, Mr. Muller, that um, we've seen uh, in other countries, uh, other parts uh, of the world, um, or ideas on how do we really start to break down those silos, um, not just around the digital divide, uh, but how we make decisions um, with a focus on wellness for our community? Um, well, you know, we started this conversation by talking about social determinants of health, uh, Dr. Avegno did, and, and, and I think one of the biggest social determinants of health is, is poverty. Um, and, and the poverty that, you know, whether you go by the official poverty rate of, of about 18%, it's almost 50% uh, uh, when you look at the ALICE threshold, the United Way's ALICE report has been so important to the community conversation around poverty. Um, and it's important to remember that the poverty and inequity uh, that we see today in, in the country and particularly in Louisiana is a result of policy choices, um, deliberate policy choices made historically over time, going back long before any of us were here and that there are policy choices we can make at the state and federal level to really help address that. Um, uh, to one of the things, and, some, and these are known things that we can do. Uh, Louisiana is one of five states without a minimum wage law on its books. Um, we could raise the minimum wage and not just $8.50 an hour like the governor's proposing, but 12. You know, Florida just had a, a statewide referendum, um, the same Voters who, who uh, voted to, to put Trump back in office in Florida also voted to raise that state's minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2026. Arkansas has raised the minimum wage. So we can lift workers. Most people who are poor are not poor because they don't work. They're poor because they work and they just don't make enough money. We can also do things like, like build a better safety net, like we started talking about, not just in healthcare, but through tax credits like the earned income tax credit. We can create a child tax credit. There are ways through the tax code to really lift up families. Um, we have a state government in Louisiana that is smaller than most. Most people don't realize that. People think of Baton Rouge as being this big bloated state government. Um, the Legislative Fiscal Office recently looked at the size of state government compared to others. Ours is among the smallest. And the way we tax our citizens, when you look at a percentage of, of people's uh, total income that goes to pay their state and local taxes, the lowest income families in our state actually pay taxes at a higher rate than those at the very top. So, so we can do things, things to lift people's wages, uh, uh, give them a little better financial footing, and we can get in, you know, next year is a fiscal session. Uh, they have two months that are supposed to be devoted to fiscal policy in Baton Rouge. There are a lot of known fixes, and, and, and Michael and I have spoken about this, and, and there are a lot of people thinking about this. We know what to do to fix our tax code to make it uh, simpler and to make it a little fairer and to make it more robust. And if we make those changes, maybe we can talk about giving teachers a raise. Maybe we can talk about investing in early childhood education so that every child, no matter where they're born, has the, the supports that they need so by the time they start kindergarten, they have the same opportunity as children from wealthier zip codes at, at, at a successful life. So we can make some policy choices. There's not a, a, a single switch that you can flip to, to make everything better, or people would have flipped that switch a long time ago, but we can make policy choices today that will lead to a much better uh, economic future for way more people, including a lot of, of segments of our state that have been historically left behind. So there are things that we can do, is what I heard, uh, and things that, that we can do now. Uh, one of our um, participants uh, asked the question, Michael, that you know our state government uh, does seem so divided, but based on your relationships and you all are sharing uh, some of the actions that can be taken now that we know um, have evidence uh, to be able to work to equitably improve um, the uh, income uh, of our most vulnerable residents uh, and ultimately lead to better health outcomes. How do we get our state government leaders, Michael, um, to hear this message uh, and start to move this needle in the right direction next session? Well, the good news um, 
doctor, is that I think there's a confluence uh, in Baton Rouge right now, and frankly, nationally, between what the uh, smart thing to do is and where people are agreeing across the political spectrum. I think there's an increasing recognition that care of mothers in utero care and care for the first thousand days has a profound and irreversible effect on mental um, and uh, into, on emotional, intellectual, and physical health. That actually what happens to you um, in utero, including stress on mothers, will actually affect the length of your telomeres and effectively how long you're going to live. And the science is now coming out to prove that irrefutably. And the good news is that when I talk to people across the political spectrum, you know, from the Southern Poverty Law Center to Charles Koch, who had a recent awakening, um, everybody <laughs> seems to kind of agree on this. And so I think in the same way, there was kind of a wave on criminal justice reform, which is still continuing in various ways. Early childhood is the next issue that we can agree on nationally and in Baton Rouge and provide more stable funding for young mothers, mothers, uh, families, and the first thousand days of people's lives that will lead to better health, uh, health outcomes for their entire lives. I think that's the sweet spot we're kind of go back to my first point, money and morality can come together in Louisiana. Absolutely. And um, again, uh, as we look at actionable things that can be done um, and where we find that sweet spot, right? Early childhood uh, development uh, is a place that we should be moving to. Um, but as we think about um, other opportunities, Dr. Vegno, um, I know that you also spend time uh, advocating for health um, as well. Uh, for uh, our most vulnerable. Um, what are other places that we should be pushing, right? Here's the time. We have a spotlight uh, on disparities shown again because of COVID-19 as well as its disparate impact economically. How do we take advantage of that? Yeah, first I have to say, I love it when the business folks talk science. Um, yeah. Thank you, Michael, for talking about <laughs> telomeres. And if we can talk business, you can talk science. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be great. Oh, um, I think- party. That's right. Um, I think, you know, capitalizing on that and going back to something that um, Ms. Sterling said, we have to find the commonalities and they're there, they just don't often get broadcast. So when we talk about the urban-rural divide, many of the challenges of rural places um, in terms of health and economics are the same in urban, particularly when we talk about broadband and the digital divide. So. I think it, you know, getting our rural legislators to understand what our urban legislators might know for parts of their community, that if we're all going to be successful, we need broadband, that's a way to bring folks together. And even with contra seemingly controversial topics like Medicaid expansion, what Medicaid expansion has done for Louisiana has enabled it to keep rural hospitals open at a time when every other state that, that has not expanded Medicaid is shutting them. These are engines, economic engines for their community, and particularly in the fight against COVID, they are more important than ever. So I think we focus too much on, you know, and this is of course a national problem. Well, we think this way in the cities and, and you know, you all think this way when there's so many commonalities that we need to work together. That's what I hope comes out of this fiscal session. Um, you know, whether it's raising the minimum wage, whether again, it's, it's showing the across the board benefit, no matter where in Louisiana you're from, um, you know, that's gonna be our charge. But again, that means we have to understand those who, who, you know, maybe don't think the same way or are not from the same place, and we have to be able to speak their language. Yeah, speak, speak in their language, right? Um, because we oftentimes, I, I love the fact, too, that Michael was talking about telomeres uh, <laughs> as well, um, because we oftentimes uh, speak in a language um, that needs to be translated, right? Whether we are in the business sector, we have our own language. Healthcare, we definitely speak a different language, um, but that leads to literacy, health literacy challenges for our community mm -hmm. members. Uh, and one of our um, uh, viewers, attendees asked, uh, they work very heavily in uh, financial lit literacy and education services, right? Do you all have any recommendations on how they translate or bridge that communications gap for our direct service workers to make sure as was mentioned many times here, 
that they are aware of services and opportunities that already exist uh, and that we are speaking in terms that are easily understandable where they can actually use the tools that are available. Now, I'll take a stab at that. One of the things that we have to do, and I made a comment earlier about when we build buildings, what's happening in the buildings and how do we bring people in? I mean, that's really where it starts is, you know, if I haven't experienced healthcare, then I really don't, you know, the only place I've been is to the emergency room and I really don't understand how, you know, how primary care works. Then experientially then that emergency room is my only path because it's what I have. And I think it's through experiencing and how we bring people in and bring them together in a way that helps them to know this is that vehicle that I can then tap into. You know, United Way in the past with some of your 211 services and, you know, there are lots of, you know, things such as that, but in my community, is there somewhere I can go that I can get someone to help me? Um, and, you know, I may not be able, I, I may not need to travel there if I don't have a car, but maybe I can walk there in a sense of this greater sense of community um, and how we care for each other, I think will break that divide. I mean, right, it just seems oftentimes that we're not even comfortable even having a conversation or asking for that help because we feel uncomfortable. And so I think it's, you know, one good side, I think, you know, there, I call them COVID blessings. There've been things that have come out of COVID that would not have happened. And I think there is a theme for some people of this shared vulnerability that has happened because the social isolation, the fear, and some of those pieces, like many of us and probably all of us are comfortable as for us, food and those pieces, but there is that other sense that is a common thread for all of us. And I think if we could create a more common sense and a common thread of humanity for all of us, that individuals can feel open to ask the question or to open a door and ask for help. Um, it really would transform, you know, our communities in just a sense of kindness and compassion. And access to uh, being able to get information, right? Where do you ask those questions? Uh, and you use uh, the emergency room as an example for healthcare uh, as really a, a place of last resort. Uh, for many, uh, for healthcare, where is that emergency room for financial literacy, right, and for financial education? Where does that exist, Michael? Or does it exist, right? Is there an emergency room that I can walk in as a community oh. member and ask questions uh, about how to improve my access to wealth? I, I think that there's a patchwork, but. Um just we we just need to do a much better job uh, equipping our young people with the tools to uh, to manage their their um, their lives and their wealth and and you know this is it, it's I think that it's an issue that children coming from backgrounds where they're going to get that input uh, it gets reinforced and those that don't don't and that just ends to, tends to exacerbate um, the differences so to the degree that prosperity is really a social good that we need to be investing in in all of our people it has to happen through things like public schools i think that's really the right place for it to occur it certainly didn't happen for me um and i went to a good public school but i think uh, that it's something that somehow is overlooked and it's assumed that people just kind of um learn it it's some jungian thing that comes out of them but financial literacy um, has to be taught and we shouldn't have to rely on Susie orman for all of it uh, agreed. Uh, we have another question um, that is related to uh, paid sick leave. So it says, well, there is a requirement for payment of sick leave for employers with less than 500 employees. If an employee has COVID and works for an employer with more than 500 employees and is not yet eligible for paid sick leave, what are some other resources that can help uh, him or her get paid? Uh, for COVID sick leave that may or may exist. And I think this goes back to our um, beginning questions. 
Does that even exist? I'm, I'm not aware of any right uh, now. Yeah, I, I don't. That's why it needs to get extended because yeah. I don't think it exists. Right. Unless yeah. somebody else knows. I, if I'm if I'm remembering the bill that Senator Cassidy has, the the supports that he had in there, I don't think it was necessarily tied to your employer or employment status. So again, you know, as Michael said earlier, taking away your ability to access um, paid health benefits from your employment is 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 critical and making making the two not reliant on each other, uh, particularly with the nature of work and how right. frequently people cycle in and out of jobs um, and the different types of jobs and the gig economy that just doesn't that might have made sense when everybody punched a clock at the same place for 40 years but it really doesn't make sense in this economy so that's either got to be a federal response either federal health care that's available to all or sort of again that federal safety net for you know extraordinary serve like this um you know there's there are service there's programs that can help you if you are out with COVID and you need food delivered to your house, but it doesn't take away the fact that you're going to be missing two weeks or more of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, it's huh? just, just one, one random point, but it's just, mm -hmm. there's so many of our workforce policies are, are antiquated. My, my favorite example, which is not, but it just shows you is the, do you know where the retirement age of 65 came from? This is for true. Otto von Bismarck in the 1870s, when he was trying to unify Prussia and he wanted to get rid of his rivals who were over 65, he instituted a mandatory 65 year old retirement age. And we've carried that forward to today. It's time to reimagine how we're going to work. And I think COVID is actually just kind of bringing that into sharp focus. I could not agree more um, that while COVID has brought it into sharp focus, uh, all of you have been working uh, for many years uh, in this space, whether through the lens uh, of uh, business leaders uh, or healthcare leaders or, or both. Um, but as we think about how we reimagine uh, what we can do to move uh, from a system of healthcare that incentivizes sick care to one of well care, uh, how we show the return on investment for our businesses uh, to start to focus and look through a health lens on intentionally um, investing in vulnerable communities to tackle uh, compound disadvantage. Uh, one of our um, viewers asked, what can business leaders who are watching today do to make a difference in this space? Uh, if each of you were thinking about what is one thing uh, that business leaders could do? We know that this uh, has, these inequities have resulted from centuries of federal, state, and local uh, and private sector policies and practices. And so we can't tackle it all uh, in one day. But if uh, I'm a motivated business leader, what's something that I can do to make a difference in this space? We'll start with you, Michael. Um, I think you have to first pick your issue. You know, uh, you just kind of just quote Louisiana, pick your passion. And then you have a lot of tools at your disposal. You have uh, the power of your wallet. Uh, you have the power of your voice and you have the power of your vote. And I think too often we just kind of abdicate responsibility to our elected officials once they're elected. The reality is that they still will be very responsive, but you've got to organize and, and activate and use the leverage of messaging and money. And then elected officials will respond to that. They will hear the message. And uh, we have a lot of, of examples of that going back to the Katrina era where we changed things and we, we you know, slayed sacred cows because the business community stood up and said, we needed levy reform, we needed education reform, we needed government reform. Um, there, we, we know that we can do this. It's a question of just personal and business will and then, and then taking action. Great, Ms. Sterling. You know, companies know that they have great influence on policy and they have lobbyists. At the end of the day, to Michael, they have to decide what they care about. Mm -hmm. Either I care about paying a living wage or I don't. Either I care about family medical leave or I don't. Um, and I think it's the same thing I'll say to the, the participants who are with us. It's not only our business leaders. Get behind, get passionate about an issue. You know, we're gonna release the Resilient Louisiana Commission report in the upcoming days. And there is a page that is about government action, but there are things that citizens can do. You know, we've asked ourselves as we have brought that report forward is, 
We don't want it to collect digital dust and we don't want it to collect dust on a shelf. We want it to be a report that we get behind because there are things in there that we want to see change because we see it as the people's report that had hundreds of individuals who came together from different sectors. And so I think it's what we're passionate about, what we care about, um, and it's what our business leaders are passionate about and care about and know that our choices create the new normal. If Louisiana is the same a decade from now, it will be because we chose that, not because it happened. Yeah, intentionality. Dr. Vigna? Yeah, I, I, I agree with the what are our priorities. Um, and I think that, you know, for business leaders, for all of us who, who lead organizations, we have to start with ourselves and look deliberately at what, what kind of structure am I um, engaging in? What am I promoting? Uh, what does that mean for my, my employees? And how do I translate that to a larger scale? Um, you know, it, it was a really heartening thing to see when one of our large health systems um, went and fully supported uh, raising the minimum wage. That is something that our major business leaders should take an interest in because they thought through it and understood how it would improve their bottom line, right? You can do things from your heart or you can do things from your head. And a lot of times you get the same results. So regardless of your motivation, it is having the true civic backbone to get up and do it. And I would wholeheartedly agree with Ms. Sterling that we've got to decide what's most important to us. It, as much as culture is important to the city and, and will always be a critical part, do we care about parties or do we care about people? Um, and we need to encourage our civic leaders to make that choice publicly and then, uh, and then act on it. Mr. Muller, what can our business leaders do to make a difference in this space? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a business leader. I'm in the nonprofit sector, but I, I think a lot of it comes back to what's your vision for economic growth? I mean, for, for 40 plus years, there's been a, a, a one side saying that, that what's good for business is for government to get as far out of the way as possible to not regulate anything, to cut taxes on the wealthy, and everything's gonna, you know, the businesses will grow and trickle down uh, the benefits to, to the masses. Uh, there's another vision of economic growth that says, if you make the right uh, investments in people, in communities, in, in safe communities, uh, in equitable communities, in education, in training, um, and you have a fair and predictable tax system that, that supports that, then you can not only create a strong economy, but you create an economy that works for more people and not just a few people at the top. One of the things about Louisiana that makes us unique, unfortunately, is we are not only one of the poorest states in the country, we also have uh, the fourth highest rate of income inequality anywhere in the country. So, so I think there is a real case to be made and I would love for the business community to pick this up to say that, look, if you know, nobody loves paying taxes, but if we can fix the, these basic fundamental things with our tax structure and make the right investments, then we really can create a stronger economy. Uh, this is not an, uh, uh, an issue that should only belong to the right and that, should, uh, and that can't involve government. government. Government can and should play an active, constructive role in creating a more fair and equitable, you know, creating the rules of the road and making the investments that allow everybody to thrive and that allow, allow everybody the opportunity to reach their highest potential, uh, no matter where they're from, no matter the color of their skin or how successful their parents were. And, and we haven't reached that ideal, we're far from reaching that, but I think we certainly can. And, and, and that requires buy-in from business because if it's just, you know, a, a small band of progressive nonprofits up at the legislature making this case, we're never going to win. Um, I mean, I've been around the legislature for almost 20 years now, and, and business drives that political process in a way the nonprofit sector does not. And, and so uh, we need business at the table. We need businesses, uh, people who, who kind of take this view of the world to not be afraid to speak up and, and to, to let their voices be, become clear and powerful in this debate, because that's what legislators are ultimately going to listen to. Well, this has been um, very, very informative. 
um, you all uh, as leaders across our state uh, in both the business, nonprofit, and healthcare sector uh, have shared with us uh, from your perspective um, things that we can do to move um, our state uh, to focusing more on equity uh, and health for all. Uh, and that is a daunting task. Um, but we have the opportunity, as you've shared with us, to make some changes now that start to reimagine, re envision uh, how the state of Louisiana can move from being uh, at uh, the bottom of every good list uh, and the top of every bad one with respect to health uh, and income equality. As you think about uh, our upcoming um, opportunities, uh, our last question to you um, today is, what makes you hopeful for the future uh, that we can start to bridge this divide uh, of health as wealth? Uh, and um, we'll get started uh, with you, Dr. Vegna. Well, I'm always an optimist um, because I truly do believe, uh, particularly in this community, that compassion will all, and, and rationality and reason will win out. Um, despite sometimes being wrong. But I, I'm always hopeful. Again, I, what I see now is a little bit of what we saw pre-Katrina, and it's a real converging of our community to fight a common enemy um, and to be successful. I know that's gonna be our challenge at the health department for the next year or so is, how can we work with everyone possible in the city of New Orleans and the region to get a vaccine so that we will be the first city fully open for business and business in a new and different way? What coalitions can be, we build? What partnerships can we strengthen that, that are not gonna end, that we really can't blow this opportunity to take those and say, well, we d if we can do this, um, then we can certainly do maternal child health. We can certainly do chronic disease prevention. We can certainly do intimate partner, partner violence and uh, you know, structural racism as a form of health disparity. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that our really hard work in the trenches now will lead to some you know, more shared communal awakenings and decision makings uh, as we get past our current crisis. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sterling. Um, one of my mentors shared, you know, the quote that I live by, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can't change the world because it's the only thing that's ever, that ever has. That's a quote from Margaret. And I just believe that, you know, you can get exhausted and tired and those things, but you have to believe that through, you know, your commitment and your passion um, that you can make a difference. and. Um, you know, we all, you know, I've lived by that from my, my peer and, you know, you get up every day and try to advance the ball, um, you know, just a little bit to say, have I, you know, made a difference? So I think it's just um, creating a sense of hope and optimism in yourself and creating a hope and optimism that you believe that ultimately um, the arc of justice, it bends slowly, but it bends, you know, in the right direction. Uh, that was a wonderful quote uh, and inspiring for all of us. Um, Mr. Mahler, what makes you hopeful? You know, um, I, young people make me hopeful. And I think the um, as tumultuous as a year as this has been, um, I, I think the the public reckoning that we are having about and the, the national conversation that is happening around racial equity um, that, you know, the, George Floyd was, was a, a spark, but that fire had been smoldering for, for a long time. And I think it woke a lot of people up to, to realities that, that people have been living, uh, uh, people uh, in, in this country for, for generations. And, and, and so I think it, it hopefully is, is shaking a lot, some people out of their complacency around issues of, of race and structural racism and institutional racism. And, and even though these are difficult conversations um, and sometimes ugly conversations and, and they're leading, but, but I think ultimately uh, that arc of, of uh, the moral universe is slowly bending towards justice. So, so I take uh, 
inspiration away from from the protest and the activism that I've seen this year. And and I hope that um, the election isn't the end of that, but but really the you know that it's going to continue into 2021. And the people who were very fired up during this political season will continue to be fired up um, as as the administrations change because nothing is going to change. Um, you know, at the national or state level, unless people stay involved and realize that that democracy is is a full time participation sport, not something you do every four years. Uh, and if if that happens, then then I think uh, very good things are possible. Thank you. Uh, and Michael, we'll let you have the last word. Well, that was all very eloquently said by everybody, and I agree. I think that 2020 is going to end up being homeopathic for this country. Um, I think it's going to be the 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 the, <laughs> the the bit of poison that builds up our our, our collective uh, political and emotional intellectual antibodies and makes us stronger. I'm inspired by the massive turnout at the election. I'm inspired by generational involvement, and we know empirically that this community comes back from hardship by honoring those who suffered by building something better. It's what we did after Katrina, and you look at the advancements we made in education and in the, and in the coast and um, in levy protection and so many other areas, and I think that we're going to do that and more right now. And, you know, um, Terry, you talk about the arc of history bending. The less elegant way that I think about it is the cha-cha of progress. It's two steps forward, one step back, but then it's two steps forward. And, uh, and, and with a little shake of the hips, you get there. And, you know, Lord knows we can dance. That's a wonderful way to think about it. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And we thank uh, each of you today. We know that your time is very valuable uh, for sharing uh, these insights with us uh, and giving us a little bit of hope um, that we can tackle this, uh, although uh, a challenge. Uh, some of the themes that I heard and I will take with me um, is, number one, uh, we need to decide what we care about, right? Do we care about our pockets or do we care about people? Do we care about partying or do we care about people? Uh, and once we decide that collectively it is that we care about people, um, we can galvanize in a way um, that will move us to action, much like we saw uh, after Hurricane Katrina and find those commonalities uh, where we have a common language on moving uh, our communities to one uh, that incentivizes wellness. Uh, and so uh, I really thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I will leave you with uh, a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. who um, I, I quote often that says, change does not roll on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous intentional struggle. And I think that's where we are and that we need to intentionally decide uh, to get in this fight uh, to promote wealth across all sectors uh, and that it won't come easy we know that the problems we are saddled with now uh, have uh, been in place for centuries, um, but that as we start to take those steps forward, uh, we will see that inevitable change and move to wellness. Uh, so thank you all so much uh, for participating in our Louisiana Leaders webinar today. Uh, and we invite all of you uh, who are with us today to join us on December 8th for our next Louisiana Leaders webinar, uh, which is Philanthropy is Good for Business. Uh, please visit the website that you see on the screen uh, to register, uh, and we would look forward to these continuing conversations and moving us to action. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank Davis. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.